You might think that 2017 was the most cheatingest year in baseball history. Stealing signs, violating baseball's midget policy, yeah, there's a midget policy. But the fact of the matter is, 2017 was nothing compared to what happened over 30 years ago. In the year 1987, as Ronald Reagan was closing out his second term, the Simpsons debuted on Tracy Ullman and we got grace with the birth of the one true lord, Timothy Tebow, baseball had reached a fever pitch. Scandals, suspicion, and a crazy conclusion to the year that made it one of the most cheatingest and insane seasons ever. We're gonna tell you all about it right after this. Well, the crowd is gathered here for the much anticipated Manscaped 690 race. It looks as if the undefeated champion Lawnmower 2.0 is about to line up. Yeah, Dick, the Lawnmower 2.0 was. What, what's this? It's a new entry on the starting gate, the Lawnmower 3.0. Dick, I've never seen anything like this. Would you look at that? I'm seeing the new and improved trimmer designed exclusively for men's below the waist grooming that has some amazing new features. Look at that diamond texture, no slip handle, and is that my word, an LED light? Dick, sources tell me it's been upgraded to 7,000 RPM, still uses the same great ceramic non-rusting blade, and now lasts up to 90 minutes of battery life. Damn son, the lawnmower 3.0 is gonna be tough to beat, but did you know you guys at home can get in on this trimming action? That's right, Dick. Race on over to manscaped.com and enter in the code 5 points and you will get 20% off the new and improved lawnmower 3.0. And if you sign up as a subscriber, you will get 25% off and get replacement blades delivered to your door every 3 months. It's like a free oil change. Plus, you get 2 free gifts. Well, it looks like it's racing time. Bust out the checkered flag and get to grooming. Manscaped.com, baby. So what exactly made 1987 the most cheatingest and insane year in baseball history? Let's find out. The home run spike. The most exciting thing in baseball is to see the ball hit very, very far, many times. Prior to 87, there was a bit of lull in power. Small ball or whitey ball, based on the principles of Cardinals manager Whitey Herzog, had changed the game, putting an emphasis on stealing bases, pitching, and playing shutdown defense. I know, right? Your mind is blown. Home runs weren't really a part of the game plan, especially in modern stadiums with awful turf and deep fences making singles and doubles all the more easy to come by. The most valuable players in this system weren't the free swingers, but patient, fast outfielders like Vince Coleman and alien life form Willie McGee that barely hit 100 combined home runs in 31 combined MLB seasons. Whitey Ball was about to go away. Power and hypodermic needles was the new wave in 1987. Enter a new class of bashing rookies, Mark McGuire, Rafi Palmero, Paul O'Neill, Fred McGriff, Ellis Burks, and Matt Williams. The ball began to fly out of the yard in 87 and no one is really sure why aside from an influx of lumberjack rookies and also the possibility that this was the beginning of the steroid era and maybe even a little juicing of the ball. Want to doubt me? Let's look at the data. During the 1986 MLB season there were a combined 3,813 balls hit out of the yard. In 1987 there were 4,458. That's a 15% increase from one year to the next, one of the largest bumps in history, like last year where it jumped 17%. Was it just a matter of new talent? Maybe it was the ball that was juice, or had NASA thinned the atmosphere around every single MLB stadium? The possibilities go on, but based on what that pillar of honesty Jose Canseco has said, it was probably withdrawal. In 1986, Jesse Barfield of the Toronto Blue Jays led the MLB with 40 home runs. A year later, there were four players who surpassed that mark, including Andre Dawson and Mark McGuire, who tied for the lead with 49 dingers. And we know one of those guys was juicing his ass off. Literally. McGuire easily won AL Rookie of the Year, and for Dawson, that year he became the first player on a last place team to win MVP. He's in the Hall of Fame, and Big Mac is not. I wonder why. There were some weird outliers too. Come on, Tigers catcher Matt Noakes jumped from three career home runs in two seasons to 32 in 1987, then fell back down to 16 homers the next year. He wouldn't hit 20 homers again until 1991. Not as suspicious as, say, Brady Anderson, but 
a little fishy. Home runs would cool for a little bit following the season and a few years after, but this year was likely the litmus test for spiking the drink. Cheating pitchers. When the ball starts flying to Neptune, how were pitchers going to keep the ball in the yard? By cheating, of course. In 1987, all integrity and decorum went out the window, and MLB pitchers began doctoring the ball like it was patient zero. Twins knuckleballer Joe Necro was busted for scuffing balls mid-game, then went on Letterman to talk about it. Phillies right-hander Kevin Gross hid sandpaper in his glove to rough up the ball, and after the glove was confiscated by the MLB, Gross called and asked for it back. Gross defended himself eloquently, saying, it was just in my glove at the time I was pitching. Sounds legit. Astros pitcher Mike Scott suddenly enjoyed back-to-back -back all-star seasons and a Cy Young in 86, two years when he struck out a combined 539 batters, up from 220 in the previous combined two years. Maybe a little bit of tomfoolery with the baseball helped K a few extra batters. Look at that ball movement. When confronted after his career, Scott admitted that every ball that hits the ground has something on it. I've thrown balls that were scuffed, but I haven't scuffed every ball that I've thrown. You've thrown balls that were scuffed? Well, who scuffed them? The pitchers knew something was up, so they did what anyone in their right mind would do. Cheat their asses off. Other cheaters and anomalies. To be fair, it wasn't just pitchers. Before Sammy Sosa made it famous, Scott's teammate, outfielder Billy Hatcher, shattered his bat on an infield single, revealing that the bat had been hollowed out and filled with cork. Hatcher never hit double-digit home runs after that. This example goes to show that cheating might not be a new phenomenon in Houston. And of course, all this cheating went on while Pete Rose bet on 52 Reds games during the 87 season, and he would subsequently be found out and be banned from baseball. On April 13th, the Padres led off a game against the Giants with three straight home runs and still lost by seven. On June 28th, Don Baylor was hit by a pitch for the 244th time in his career, setting a new record. On August 11th, Mark McGuire set the new American League rookie record with 38 home runs. He made it to 49 was probably juicing. That same day, the Brewers' Paul Molitor went hitless to abruptly end a 39-game hitting streak, the longest in the AL since Joe DiMaggio made it to 56. On September 21st, Daryl Strawberry and Howard Johnson became the first teammates to hit 30 home runs and steal 30 bases. They were probably on coke, not Roy's. The stunning, possibly slanted conclusion. Perhaps the most thrilling part of the 1987 MLB was its ending. The 87 World Series between the Minnesota Twins and the St. Louis Cardinals was about as entertaining, bizarre, and cheatingly as it gets. And it was the perfect, fitting finale for an insane year in baseball. The series pitted Minnesota, an 85-win team, against St. Louis, a 95-win team. Given that Minnesota played in the Metrodome, this was the first World Series to feature games played indoors with a roof that gave them a decided advantage, something we'll talk about. Minnesota was overmatched in nearly every statistical category, but the Cardinals were without their power-hitting first baseman, Jack Clark who supplied 23 more home runs than the second leading player on the team. Minnesota won the first game 10-1 in the Dome, combating Whitey Ball with two home runs, including a Dan Gladden Grand Slam. The Twins took game two, scoring eight runs and blasting a couple more long balls. But St. Louis fought back at home, playing their brand of baseball in a 3-1 victory that was aided by Busch Stadium's pitcher-friendly dimensions. St. Louis took the next two games, turning a 2-0 deficit in the series into a 3-2 lead. The Cardinals stole five bases in the fifth game of the series, the most in a World Series since 1907. Back in Minnesota, on cue, the ball started to jump again, and the Twins put up 11 in a Game 6 victory that forced a do-or-die Game 7. On the mound for the winner-take-all game was Frank Viola, who pitched for the first time since Game 1 and once again mowed down the Redbirds lineup, earning him MVP honors and securing the Twins' first World Series since 1924 when they were the Washington Senators. At 85 and 77, the Twins accomplished the impressive feat of having the worst winning percentage of any team to win the World Series. They only won 29 road games in the regular season. Of course, there was a reason they were much better at home. 
Years later, a Metrodome technician claimed he used the building's air conditioning a bit selectively to help the ball fly a little better when the twins were at the plate. You bastard. Al Michaels also wrote in his memoir that he believed the twins pumped in artificial crowd noise to aid their home field advantage. Also, the roof was stark white and fly balls disappeared into the ether, making them very difficult to track and easy to drop. And guess what? It was the first World Series where every game was won at home. The only other one, four years later, in the same place. But hey, at least they weren't stealing signs. Stow that asterisk on the craziest season in baseball history. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do not forget to check out manscaped.com and use my code 5 points and get 20% off your first order and free shipping. I'm 5 points vids and you made it to my next video.